today? The side feeling good? Yeah, a little bit over here. Those of you at home, huh? Yeah, I wore my vacation shirt. That's what this is. Some of you are like, oh yeah, I'm feeling it. Bright, colorful, because uh, I'm excited about wrapping up the series today. How about those baptisms today? Wasn't that awesome? Man, whoo! I got uh, invited to be in the tub with uh, Jamie this morning. It was incredible. If you got baptized, congratulations. Um, I am excited to spend a few minutes with you wrapping up this series. But first, last Saturday, I was at a birthday party for my friend Josh Roshan, a 40th birthday party, got invited down to M. Osteria, downtown Toledo. They have a second story like a party area. And so we were hanging out with friends. I was having dinner with Ryan, his wife, my wife. We were seated by a window that overlooks a parking lot. We're having a great time. And in the middle of our dinner, Ryan is like, I think that woman just got assaulted or something. And so we look out the window and we're looking in the parking lot. And all I see is a woman. I can't hear her, but she's got her arms out. She, you could tell she's upset. She's yelling. And I asked the question, should we go and help? And uh, we, I, I can't really even see what happened. Like, are you sure is what I'm thinking? And as I ask the question, should we go? She takes off running towards the building, out of sight. I don't know what's going on, but it looks intense. My wife goes, yeah, go, go, go. So I do. I go running down the stairs, down the stairs like at a frantic pace. So much of people are looking at me in the first floor of the restaurant. I go bursting out of the door. And as I'm going out the door, I'm like, are you sure you know what you're getting yourself into? So I come around the corner and I take a, like a mental inventory of what's happening in the parking lot. I don't know if I'm running into 20 people or two or five or what, but there are two guys running across the parking lot. And as they're running across the parking lot, the one guy that's chasing the guy in front of him says, get that, insert swear word, okay, get that guy, okay? So I start running after him. And I, you know, why are you laughing? I know, I'm not so much of a linebacker build, I'm more like a water boy build, okay? You're like, if you don't know, now you know, okay? So I look for weapons, and I start, you know, I can outrun pretty much anybody. And I do some mental math. Like, I got to preach the next day, so I don't really want a black eye. I want to save the story for another time the following weekend. And so some of you don't believe me, but it's a true story. I, I kind of, like, body check him into the building or, like, you know, Snyder run, push him into the building to slow him down, which I do. And he tries to slip away from me and I grab his arm and I slow him down enough. Like I got his arm. He's not going very far trying to slip out of the sweatshirt. I got him. I just slow him down enough for the other guy to come around the corner. And he's got a full fist punch coming down right on his cheek. And I'm like, oh, this is bad. I don't know who the criminal is. Maybe this guy was trying to get away from the criminal. I got it all wrong. You know, it's like, this isn't going very well. I'm like, don't kill him. Don't kill him. I'm trying to hold the guy down. Don't, it's going to be, you know, it's like, it's, I'm trying to put the pieces together. And as the yelling and swear words and all of that stuff is going, this guy that's throwing the punches, I realize he's the husband of the woman that was in the car. And apparently the woman comes over and she gives him a whole mouthful too. You know, it's like, oh, he was, the criminal was in her car. She didn't know. So So he was trying to steal her stuff, and the husband's like, here to, oh, okay, I'm putting it all, you know, police will be here, I think, I hope, in a few minutes, you know, people start coming out of the restaurant, and within a few minutes, we're surrounded by some others, and uh, someone asked the question, like, hey, what happened here? I turned, it's the guy that was sitting in the car that's kind of responsible for the parking lot, not responsible, but checking in cars, like, he couldn't see anything that happened, so I turn around to answer him, he's like, hey, pastor, I watch you on TV. <laughs> like, this is so weird, you know? And then I start to replay the whole thing in my head. And I realize, man, they could have had, like, knives, guns. I mean, my wife pretty much just ushered me right to my death. <laughs> so I started thinking about, like, how did I get here, you know? And the police ultimately showed up and all that stuff. But it's like, you have that moment. Like, do we... Do we go or do we wait? Is someone else going to go and help? While I was running down the stairs, I was thinking, am I really ready for what I'm about to run into? What, like, what if I get hurt? What if there are, you know, and so I think we all face some of those types of moments in the adventure of you. We've been talking about every week. <laughs> How adventures have these ingredients. There's an uncovering where what had been there all along gets uncovered. And you see with fresh eyes, like, oh, 
which oftentimes leads to challenges that you don't really love, but it's a part of the adventure, which ultimately leads to a clarifying. We talked about this last week, where you zero in on a bit of what you were created to do, and it builds to this moment where you're either going to step in or you're going to step away. You're either going to say, it's my time, or you're going to go, someone else will cover that. You're going to participate or pass. And so the bottom line as we wrap up the adventure of you, it's really a question that I think we shouldn't just ask once. It should be an ongoing spiritual dialogue within our heart, with God, with the people who are on this life-changing adventure with us. And the question is this, what God opportunity is he inviting you to step into? What is the God opportunity that has been placed in front of you? And are you going to step into it? Because I think what happens is we, we, it's like we talk ourselves out of it. And then we wonder like why our relationship with God kind of feels like oh, a little uh, meh. See, there's a difference between a good opportunity and a God opportunity. A good opportunity you take. It's like, duh, it's obvious. It's easy. A God opportunity, especially in the adventure of you, there is risk involved, which means it might cost us something. If there's no risk, there's no need for faith. And so a God opportunity usually has an element of like, oh, okay, okay, am am I ready for this? So wherever you're at in your journey, I'm really glad that you're here. If you're attending with us physically, thanks for joining us. If you're tuning in online, on Facebook, on YouTube, on TV, man, what a privilege to be able to use technology. And I know there are some men who are watching at Toledo Correctional. We love being a part of this every week with you. Will you put your hands together to tell them, hello, we see you. Every week we've been looking at stories. I hope you've enjoyed them. I've enjoyed telling them, and I want to look at one more. It's the story of Esther. And if you went to Sunday school or you experienced a little bit of this when you were a kid, man, you are familiar with the story. If you've never heard it before, it's like Game of Thrones meets The Bachelor, okay? It really is. And so there's this orphan girl um, who gets promoted to queen of the most powerful nation of the country and the world at that time, and she is used by God to rescue the whole nation of Israel. And this isn't just a fairy tale. She's a part of history to the point where Jewish people celebrate her story every year. They have a holiday set apart to acknowledge the work that Esther did. Now, here's what's interesting. There are two books of the Bible named after women. And I know historically and tragically, sometimes women are treated as second class, like men are better than females. And that's just wrong. That is not, that does not honor the way that God created them, male and female. In fact, Jesus, what I love about Jesus is he actually elevated and valued both women and children to a place of equality, spiritual equality, where women were actually followers of his. They got to sit at his feet and learn. And so the truth is, women play a key role in being a difference maker throughout the Bible, but in our world today. And so... I think that's what I love about this story. Now, as I was preparing, I was reminded that this uh, book, there is no mention of God in the book, which is interesting. Like God, God's name is not said anywhere in the book. You got to ask the question like, God, why'd you do that, bro? You know, it's like, if, it, if, if I'm writing a book about me, I'm putting my name somewhere in there, you know, but I think there are moments in our life, in your life, and I know there have been times in mine where it feels like God is invisible, where you're not really seeing his name. It's like, where are you at, God? Not feeling you? Don't see you? Are you there? I mean, have you ever, have you ever judged God? Like, you're like, God, I think you're misbehaving. You're not doing what, you, <laughs> what I think you should be doing right now. You know, should, if, why is all of this bad stuff happening? Why'd you allow this person, this event, this thing, this pain in my life? See, there are times, and some of you are there right now, where he feels far away. And I think in in this moment in Israel's history, God feels far away. I think they don't see his name the way that they had in their past. His people are in exile. That means they've been driven away from home. And if you think about their history, that they would remember is that they were slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years, far away from the promised land until a guy by the name of Moses, and then ultimately Joshua, we talked about Joshua and Rahab a couple weeks ago, came and they made the journey into the promised land. And then in the promised land, they became an amazing kingdom of people under King David and King Solomon, wealthy, prestigious, powerful, 
powerful. And then ultimately they started to drift away from God until they were ultimately overtaken by the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar. If you remember the Sunday school story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they're sent into the furnace and they don't burn up, or Daniel and the lion's den, another popular story. It's after that where they're still under this Persian reign, and it feels like God has been silent-ish for 150 years. And the temptation that we face in those moments is to give up on God. It's to stop asking the question, what is the God opportunity that he has for me to take because you don't see his name? And so we stop asking the key question that we need to ask because all we see is the obstacle. You see the challenge. And if it's not today, there'll be a moment in your faith journey where you can't see God. You're going to have to trust him. Even when you can't feel him, you can faithfully move towards him. You can trust that if he feels invisible, he's still involved. If you can't see his name, that doesn't mean he's left the game. The problem is, maybe the reason that we don't ask the question in the midst of the obstacle is because most obstacles are God opportunities in disguise. And it's easy to miss that when all you're focused on is the problems. And you're like, I'm stuck, man. Wait for God to fix it. He's not fixing my problems. So God, are you even there? And maybe instead of just sitting back and waiting for God to take the obstacle away, pay attention to his activity. Where are... Where are some God things at work? And I think you'll see the opportunity. Ask the question in the midst of the obstacle, God, what are you, what are you inviting me into here? And that's the context really for the story of Esther. And I think maybe one of the reasons why you don't necessarily see his name, it's not that he's not at work, because he is. It was the third year of King Xerxes' reign. He was the king of Persia, a powerful a powerful king, a powerful kingdom at this point in human history. Perhaps you saw Xerxes in the, uh, his appearance in the movie 300. He was a powerful god-like deity. That's the way they portrayed him in the movie. And some people may um, believe, that may, some people believe that it's not the same king, same era, but it, they have similar similarities. They're both the king of Persia and they love to party. They love to display their grandeur. They love to show the world their glory and their power. In fact, for 180 days, Xerxes declared a party in the nation of Persia with unique signature goblets and all sorts of stuff to display their wealth, their glory, and their power. And they ended it with a seven-day straight banquet. A more accurate term would be a seven-day kegger, like a kegger party, you know? Like, yeah, because ain't no party like a Persian party. Because a Persian party don't, you know, it's like last seven days. So in the last day, after I'm sure they've had plenty to drink, and I'm, ah, you know, it's like, woo, they call Queen Vashti to come on in to display her beauty. And she says no to the king because she's got a party of her own that she doesn't want to leave. Well, that's a problem. Like all of the king's buddies, all of his advisors are like, bro, this isn't good for us, right? And so what do guys do when things don't go well with their wives? They, they, they don't talk to their wives about it. They call their buddies and says, that's what the, women everywhere begin to despise their husbands when they learn that Queen Vashti has refused to appear before the king. It's like women across the land are going to be like, you can't tell me what to do. And all you ladies, you're like, mm-hmm, you know that's true. Huh, that's right. <laughs> and so what do the guys do here? They, they make a small problem into a crisis, right? They take a fever and they turn it into paralysis for four days in bed. <laughs> I know I'm talking about myself here too. <laughs> they turn a small job into torture. I mean, look at what they said. They said, before this day is out, the wives of all the king's nobles throughout Persia and Media will hear what the queen did to the king, and they'll start treating their husbands the same way. There'll be no end to their contempt and anger. And some guys are like, that explains a lot, okay? <laughs> and it's like, it's funny how you read these stories, and you got to remember, they've been drinking for seven days. Like, they're wasted, which means that's a perfect time to make a major decision, isn't it? And that's what they do. They make these big declarations. Queen Vashti, taken away her crown forever, cannot be repealed. She's going to be replaced. And men, you're in charge of your household. And that's the way it's going to be. That'll teach them. And that's the way that the book starts. The king reinforcing his authority and his power and trying to make a public statement about men being superior to women. And then what happens after this is the very first episode of The Bachelor. That's right. 
The very first episode, the OG Bachelor started right here. They brought all of the women in, and they were going to pick a queen from the most beautiful of the land. As a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with many other young women, was brought to the king's harem at the fortress of Susa and placed in Haggai's care. Think about this. The most powerful man in the world, the most powerful kingdom, full of riches and wealth and power and party and opulence, and an orphan girl of a defeated people. And that was Esther. Both of her parents died. She was being raised by a relative named Mordecai. She was a slave. She was a nobody. All of these major, major life-defining setbacks. What was her mindset going into this? I mean, what would your mindset be? See, sometimes we get so focused on our circumstances, on our past, on, on all of the problems that we miss the potential of what God may be doing. We're too busy complaining about the noise in our life that you miss God's quiet invitation to step into what he's inviting you into next. My marriage will never get better. Oh, I can't find the one. I'm so alone. No one ever notices me. I'm always getting passed up. I'm never gonna make the, find the, get the. People are so unfair to me. And here's the truth. Your greatest opportunities are on the other side of an obstacle. And we're never going to get there if all you're focused on is the problem. When the obstacle you're facing is bigger than the God you're following, the the vision of your God is too small. But in the midst of the obstacle, if you see the opportunity, if you see and trust that God, even if you can't see his name, is still at work and you listen, adventure awaits the adventure of you. That's what makes the movies that we love so meaningful to us. It's that defining moment. It reminded me of the story of the movie Jaws. If you've never seen the movie Jaws, it's a movie about a shark. And when they started shooting the film, they had this idea of having this big mechanical shark swim around and be a part of the movie. It was going to be a technological breakthrough. But the problem is, is it broke and sank to the bottom of the ocean. That's an obstacle. That's a problem. And so this young director stepped back and he said, maybe there's an opportunity here. Maybe we can create curiosity and use sound design and glimpses of the shark to enable the human imagination to do what a mechanical shark could never do Suddenly, people in their imagination will see more than we could ever put on the screen. And Jaws became one of the biggest movies of all time. Some of you are right there. You're like, oh, yeah, I'm feeling it. That's what put Steven Spielberg on the map. And now, film schools today, they study his technique. Why? To learn how to push through the obstacles. When things show up, doesn't mean you give up. How do we do that today? I think we keep learning from the stories of people who've had to go through challenges. One of the ways that I do that is I attend the Leadership Summit every year. It's a conference that we're a simulcast site for. We invite people to join us every year. And I know the excuses that many of you give. Well, I'm not a leader and blah, blah, you know, it's like, I want to say blah, 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 blah. (laughs) Because this for me is two days where it's not about whether you're a leader or not. You get to sit down and I allow God to bring clarity to bring insight into my life, to help me make sure that I'm seeing the God opportunities that he has. And so when you listen to these marketplace, different leaders in different stages of life bring their story and spiritual principles, it brings insights that help us break through some of the obstacles that we feel stuck in. I would love to have you join us this year. That's a key thing that we do every single year, and we get nothing out of it. We believe that the benefit that it adds your life is instrumental. It's like kids camp for adults. Now, here's one of the reasons why I think we miss opportunities is is because opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. That was attributed to Thomas Edison until I looked it up and we can't verify that. So let's just make it my quote, okay? (laughs) Ben Snyder says, opportunity, I think about it, opportunity is missed because it looks like work. It doesn't look spectacular. I love the way that John Piper said it. What's helpful is to realize that God is doing thousands of things in your life. And you might be aware of three of them. God is at work a lot more than you realize. 
I don't think it'll be till we get to heaven when we go, oh, wow. You want to see God at work? Write your story. Because when you write your story, like we've been asking people to do, you look back and suddenly you see the hand of God in your life. Instead of running from the problem, step into it. Even when you can't see him, trust him. Now, Esther, she didn't blow off this opportunity. She didn't just write it off and say, I'm just an orphan girl and I'm a nobody. No, she leaned in. And she actually got selected against all odds to be a part of the final group. Let's call it the final 12, right? Here's what that meant. It meant that before each young woman that was selected was taken to the king's bed, she was given the prescribed 12 months of beauty treatments, six months with oil and myrrh, followed by six months with special perfumes and ointments. How many of you would be like, I feel a lot better about life with 12 months of spa treatments? Anybody? A few of you? Maybe? A couple of you. All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's all right. Put that hand up. It's like me. Yes. Mother's Day is coming up, bros. You got an opportunity, okay? 12 months. Good luck with that. All right. She's presented to the king, and here's what, here's what you see. King loved Esther more than any of the other young women. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. Whoa. Amazing. From orphan to queen. I mean, Cinderella, Ariel, Moana, they got nothing on Esther. Somebody from Disney, you know what they need to do? They need to start reading the Bible because they'd have movies for days, you know? It's like an endless supply of content, and they're incredible stories. Now, the challenge for Esther, I think the challenge sometimes for us, isn't always the obstacle. It's to look at this amazing opportunity and go, well, well, this is it. Sometimes it's the amazing, it's the abundance, it's the awesome, not the obstacle, that keeps us from seeing the opportunity that God is inviting us into. And so what we have to remember is, yes, obstacles sometimes are uh, God opportunities in disguise, but opportunities from God are also always bigger than you. God doesn't bless you for you. He blesses you so that you'll be a blessing to others. God doesn't promote you so that you get to the top of the org chart and be like, look at me, <laughs> I've arrived. I pulled myself up by my, no. No, he, he promotes you to give you an opportunity to promote or bring up people, to pass along that blessing. He doesn't give you money or financial resources just so that you can buy whatever your heart desires. It's not that those things are bad, but he gives us earthly resources so that when we honor God first with our finances and we give back to him first, he uses those resources to make an eternal return on that investment, to be a blessing for others in a way that will last far more than money will, right? Because we can't take money with us. God doesn't give you followers or influence or friends just so that you can say or post whatever's driving you crazy or whatever you want. No, he puts people around you so that you will be a mouthpiece for God in their life. Now, it's not that the amazing is bad. You shouldn't feel guilty about it. It's not. But when the blessing is just about you, then the blessing becomes a curse. And it keeps you from God's best. And I think that's the challenge that Esther may face. It's like, wow, God, thanks. This is amazing. I never saw it coming. An orphan girl, you know, from my childhood, I wondered why all this bad happened. Well, suddenly I feel better about all of it because you gave me all of this stuff. And if she's not careful, Esther can't see it now, but what feels like her greatest blessing could become the biggest threat for her to miss the real God opportunity that he has coming next. Because in Esther chapter 3, we're introduced to Haman. Haman is the king's advisor. Think Jafar from Aladdin, right? He's kind of creepy and very egotistical when he walk around. People were supposed to bow to him. And Esther's cousin Mordecai doesn't bow. And so, so Haman gets mad. He, he does what any you know, like ego-focused person does. He wants Mordecai killed. And so he enacts a plan to manipulate Xerxes into a decree that would eliminate and exterminate all of the Jews. It's one of the biggest acts of racism over his fragile ego. It's stupid. And Xerxes, 
He gets manipulated. He's probably been drinking too much, goes right along with it, and he doesn't know that Esther is Jewish. And so in Esther chapter 4, friends start texting Esther like, hey, E, what you going to do? Are you going to talk to the king? You have to do something. This isn't good. Have you heard? And her message back, no, there wasn't texting back then, but they had messengers, you know. She said, all the king's officials, even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die. Unless the king holds out his golden scepter. You guys remember what happened to Vashti, right? Girl's struggling. King hasn't called for me to come to him for 30 days. Like, hey, friends, I know what you're asking me to do. But this is what happens when abundance meets a God opportunity. It's like, ooh, I've arrived. Like, I've got this life, and it's comfortable, and it's stress-free, and... You know, I don't have to get up early to come in and serve on Dream Team on Sunday. I watch at home. It feels good. Like, I got, I got, I got things that I love. Like. I'm comfortable. They'll never know, Esther's thinking. They'll never know that I'm Jewish. I think I can hide it. Why risk all of this? Why put my life in harm's way? So sometimes it's so tempting to let the sparkly things of life distract us from the God opportunities that he has for us. And so Mordecai sends a message back. He says, don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all of the other Jews are killed. Do you know what God opportunities do? They have a way of bringing reality to our life, to break the sense of false security that we found in the stuff that we have. It brings an eternal perspective. Like, what's really going to matter in 100 years? In 100 years, what, think about it. What's going to matter? It's your relationship with God. It's the relationship with God that the people have around you. Mordecai is bringing like, hey, I know you think you're, you, can like, you can escape this, but he's bringing spiritual vision to Esther's life. He goes on. Look at what he says next. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. I love what he's saying here, right? He's saying, hey, Esther, God doesn't actually need you to do what he's going to do. Like if you don't, it's not like it's all on you. He'll get done what he needs to get done, but it'll cost you. But who knows? If perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. God doesn't need us. He's not sitting there going, man, Ben doesn't pull his act together. My whole plan's out the window. No, he's going to get done what he needs to get done. But he chooses to invite you and me to be a part of the story that he's writing. That is the adventure of you. And sometimes it's disguised in obstacles. And other times in the midst of our amazing, abundant life, we need to remember that that blessing is meant to be a blessing for others. It's always bigger than you. And do you know how else you can recognize a God opportunity? Opportunities from God move us toward what moves him. They always move us in the direction of the things that God values. You want to experience God in your life? Move towards what matters to him. Mordecai's like, hey, God's people, Esther, they matter to him, and he'll save them. But maybe God has an adventure for you for such a time as this. Are you going to step into it, or are you going to step away? Even though you can't see his name, are you going to step into the game, the adventure that he has for you? And she does. It's amazing. I'd love to read to you all of the things, the strategic and grace-filled ways that she reveals Haman's plot and ultimately it's all unraveled and she is used by God to rescue his people. What makes Esther's story so powerful is she risked her life to save the lives of thousands and she's a sign of a better, a true and better Esther that was to come. Jesus, the son of God, who didn't just risk his life, he gave his life to rescue thousands from an eternity separated from him. What Esther couldn't see in the moment is that 30 or 40 years later, because of the influence of a Jewish orphan who became a queen, a cupbearer would be coming before a different Persian king named Nehemiah. And because of that influence, because they were still around, that king would give Nehemiah permission to begin rebuilding Jerusalem. And as he rebuilt Jerusalem, and you can read about Nehemiah in the, in the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament. Then a priest named Ezra, another book in the Old Testament, shows up and preaches and lives are changed. Do you see how they're all connected in the story that God is writing? 
You see, what we can't always see in the moment is the God opportunity that God puts in front of us. It's not always big and huge. It could be small, but it plays a role in impacting people for eternity, where we make heaven more full, where we're participating in the ongoing work that God is contributing to in our world. And we get to play a part in that. And that's incredible. But it means we're going to have to step into some of the obstacles. We're going to have to step beyond some of the abundance that's just ours and invite others into it. We're going to have to move towards the things that matter to God. And that can be challenging. I know many of you live this out. And one of the things I love to do is to highlight your stories. A story like Carrie. Carrie has faced some personal hardship that I know some of you can imagine because you've faced it yourself. But many of us, it's hard to wrap our heart and mind around it. And yet in the midst of that, I want you to listen to how she was looking and listening for the invitations from God to be a part of the story that he's writing in her and through her. Let's watch. On March 12th, 2019, my son was in a car accident and lost his life. My son was born when I was 21. He was my youngest. He was hilarious. He made everybody smile. There wasn't a person that met him that didn't like him. He would do anything for anybody. He was just that kid. You know, I heard stories at his funeral that I was absolutely like blown away by. He loved to wrench on vehicles, which is what him and his friend were doing that day. He was working on a sand, a sand rail with his friend, the one who was driving. And I was laying in bed. It was probably eight o'clock at night. And I hear my son-in-law screaming out in the hallway and I hear my daughter start screaming and before they said anything I just kind of knew and I heard my son-in-law say Eddie and I was like no not Eddie I'm like it can't be and I went in my room and sat on my bed and there sat my gun so I picked my gun up because you felt nothing but heartbreak and I had the gun like halfway up and I heard God as clear as day say Carrie stop put it down I have a purpose for you and I instantly just put my gun down you know to see my daughter's like suffering was horrible and I just knew like I had to hold like to God and even in that broken moment he you know stopped me from doing something that something that would have really hurt my daughters more and my granddaughter a couple times after that you know I was going to try to kill myself and God stopped it like every time I think what finally brought me out of the darkness was one day because I was living with my daughter my oldest at the time I was in bed with my granddaughter we were watching something for a little while you feel no love or feelings and I looked at her and I'm like I like God just brought that love back into my heart and I'm like I have to do this for her so I started taking my granddaughter to the parks going swimming you know spending so much time with her and she just made all that love come back that I didn't think I could have again it's almost like you're afraid to love again I went to grief share and the woman that I ended up going to her grief share her son died when he was 10 and she made such a huge impact in my life Grief Share is a uh, Christian-based grieving group. The first one I had went to, I went to the boy's mother that was driving because I wanted her to know. I was like, I'm not mad at Dylan because I've known him since he was little. And I said, "Um, I feel like we should go to Grief Share together. So we ended up going to different Grief Shares, and that at a time I couldn't hold any thoughts made, like, a huge impact on on me, you know, because you go through some self-destructive times but you always, God's pulling you back. And I would go around and witnessing, after my son passed, I would witness to people. I don't remember what I said, but it was like words just pouring out of my mouth that God was giving me. It's something I've never experienced in my life, and that verse that says, he's closest to the brokenhearted, it's a true verse. I could hear him. They say that grief comes in waves, and you never know what's going to, like, when it's going to hit, when it's going to trigger. Like, in the beginning, if you were happy, it felt horrible, because you're like, he's dead, and I'm happy I shouldn't be happy now the days of like happiness are growing I went through growth track and then I went to leadership training 
because I knew after he passed, God said, one day you're going to lead a grief share. I went in and I'm just trying to like get to my seat quickly because I always love to be in the background. Like that's just me. And the campus pastor, Chris, and the associate pastor, Phil, both approached me and I'm like, and I just knew it was like God. And I told him my story. It was like God just started pouring, pouring it out of my mouth. And they are the ones who said, we really encourage you to go through growth track and go into like a leadership role and, you know, lead like a grief share. I'm like, God's told me this a long time ago. I just didn't think it would happen that quickly. You know, part of my purpose for Christ is to help people through what I've been through. So it's a, like, it's amazing to see in two years where he's actually brought my life. Because two years ago, I would think I didn't want to live, you know. And I just kept, even through the hard times, like crying out to him, holding on to God. It's like the worst tragedy of your entire life that you never think you can make it past. But over these past few years, I definitely feel his healing. Carrie, I know you're watching in Finley. Thanks. Thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for modeling for our church how to trust God in what to me feels like almost impossible circumstances. And I know, I know the grief isn't gone. And I know not everybody can understand the depth of the hurt that sometimes you feel. But man, we are with you and for you and love cheering with you as you continue healing and living into, leaning into the purpose that God has for you. And we're excited to see the ways that God's going to use you in the days and years to come. And so thanks, thanks for sharing. And I know her story isn't the only story of somebody who's faced challenge, heartache, grief. Some of you are in the midst of it now. I want you to hear this. Like the heart of this series is to try to convince you that your life is worth living like every piece of it, you are not an accident. And I know you hear me say that, but it's so easy to drift back into this space where it's like, is it worth it? Why are we doing this? And why, oh, God, God must not really be a, pleased with me. And he, he instead is looking at you going, I have an adventure for you. And no, it's not always gonna be easy, but lean in. Some of you were asking, well, why? Like, what's the reward? What, what, what are we going to get out of this in the long term? I mean, if, if nothing here on earth is going to last for eternity, and if God's going to do it anyway, why do I participate? I'm so glad you asked the question. First century pastor, the Apostle Paul, was talking about all that he had suffered to a group of Christians in Thessalonica. You can read it in First Thessalonians. He says, after all, what gives us hope and joy? What is it that will be our proud reward? What will be our crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? His answer is you. His answer is you are connected to the work that he was used by God to do thousands of years ago. And when you lean into the adventure, you get kingdom crowns, which aren't earthly rewards. They are eternal rewards of people being shoulder to shoulder with you, looking at you going, hey, you played a role in changing my life. I know some of you, you're sitting there going, well, I can't do that. I, I'm not Carrie. I'm not the Apostle Paul. No, you're not. God's uniquely gifted you to make a contribution, to be a part of a life-giving movement of people. And sometimes we underestimate the impact of small acts like Kendra Manuel, wife of Nate Manuel, who you see sing sometimes on our stage. She invited her best friend in college, her best friend's name, Meredith. So Meredith attended a service at West Toledo. And it was during that service, even though she had grown up in church, where she realized that Jesus was more than just a name, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. And she told me a few weeks ago that a light bulb went off and it changed the trajectory of her life and that of her boyfriend at the time, Kyle. And so they were introduced to Jesus at Cedar Creek and they got involved and plugged in until they graduated from college and they went down to Columbus to start a career. And then for those of you that know, we help start us a church in Columbus called Rock City. They were here and we sent them out and supported them and cheered for them. And Kendra invited Meredith yet again to be a part of that, to be a part of the launch group. And they said yes. And a 
couple weeks ago, I was down in Columbus celebrating their 10th anniversary, their 10th birthday. And now Kyle isn't just uh, pursuing a career. He's the campus pastor for their Hilliard campus where they team up together to impact thousands of lives. Kendra's invite of her best friend played a role in thousands of people being impacted in Columbus. And I heard story after story, thousands of lives changed because of a single invite. Thousands of lives changed because a life-giving church got behind a startup in Columbus. And so if you gave and contributed here, you're contributing to a work that's continuing to change lives and plant churches out of that church. You've got kingdom crowns. You know, when you stand at the door and you smile at a guest, you're not just smiling. You're stepping into a God opportunity where you don't know the story of the person that's walking in and how God's using your smile or your time with their kids or your investment in that student's life or the way that you go around to make sure that the place looks tidy, clean, excellent, secure, safe, parking lot, whatever it is. This is what the dream team is about. It's not just volunteering at church. It's stepping into the work that God wants to do today. What gets me pumped up is when people see that. In fact, they wrote a song that is unreleased. It's called Kingdom Crowns, and they gave us permission to share it with you today. And so our band is going to wrap up the service celebrating that and to put an exclamation point on this for all of our campuses today. We had an individual near the end of the worship set say, I need to get baptized today. His name's Tim. And I know Tim's story. I know that he's been through some personal health challenges of his own. And he's seen God at work. And today he wants to go public with his faith in Christ. And so we're going to take a moment and turn it over to Tim as he gets baptized today. Thanks for letting us celebrate this moment with you, brother. God has a story for you. It's the adventure of you. And my hope and prayer is that you begin to see it. That in the midst of the challenges, you step into it. That you let him clarify what he's wired you and gifted you to do. And when the time comes, you take that God-sized risk. You step into that God opportunity. That we would be people who pursue kingdom crowns together. And I think as we lean into that, we are going to stand in awe of how God uses this humble, simple place of people just like you, just like me, to make an eternal difference. So will you make that your prayer with me right now? God, thank you for stories like Esther. Thank you for stories like Tim and Carrie. Thank you for the stories of people here at Cedar Creek where you're at work. Give us spiritual vision, God, to see the opportunities that you're putting in front of us. Don't let us get stuck in the obstacles. Don't let us get tempted away into safety and comfort by the abundance that's around us. God, move our heart towards what moves yours. And we open-handedly want to follow wherever you lead. Because we trust that when you're involved, heaven is more full. And so we want to courageously follow wherever you lead. And we pray this, not in our strength, but in the powerful, gracious name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Thanks.